Hello again and welcome to another episode of the Digital Health and Wearables series. Before I go ahead and introduce another magnificent guest for you, I'd like to acknowledge our global partners and sponsors, Spirit Digital. Make sure you uh, check them out and also subscribe to the channel for the coming uh, new guests and all the content that is available to you. I'm extremely excited to introduce uh, Dr. Bertalan Mesco today, which is the medical Futurist is a global keynote speaker and in, is also one of the most well-recognized voices in the digital health space. Hello, Bertolin. How are you? It's very kind of you. Thank you, Joao. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you. I'm really fine. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. I'm good. Thank you. So, we haven't seen each other since like 2018 in, in London, I, I assume. Yeah, that's uh, that's correct. Has been has been quite a few years, but uh, yeah, <laughs> um, fantastic to have you here. I'm really delighted. Thank you for your time and everything. And it's nice to see you again, as I said. And the, the first question that I have for you is: You do a lot of work with big pharma. What are the industries that will be most impacted by digital health? And what are the industries that not they are not taking advantage of it right now? Well, first of all, um, I would have had a different response before the pandemic hit. And therefore, my response is very much impacted by how COVID-19 has been impacting the adoption of digital health technologies. Because what I've seen is, a, is like a skyrocketing increase in the adoption of the technologies themselves even though the cultural transformation is still lagging behind. So from this perspective, um, health insurance, the way the pharma industry has been doing its business, how healthcare is organized, how the vaccination rollout is going on, how patients can access their own data, all these are impacted by digital health technologies. But maybe because of the pandemic, there are a few specific areas like telemedicine, or at-home lab tests, um, the use of portable diagnostic devices, and maybe even artificial narrow intelligence that will be the most impacted by such technologies. No, fantastic, great answer. Moving on to the next question. How could we create a health system that adapts, adapts to the individual patients and not the health system that the patient have to adapt to? What an, what an amazing question. And um, I don't want to be too long in my answer, but this brings up many points, many, many assumptions here. First of all, if you look at the very near, his very short history of digital health, we can see that it all started with, with the notion that there was a hierarchy in medicine. I think even since Hippocrates, there has always been a hierarchy, uh, a, a kind of relationship where physicians or medical professionals in general are leading healthcare for patients. They tell them what to do, they prescribe medications for them and treatments, and they make the diagnosis, they make all the decisions related to the patient. That, that was the norm that we lived in forever. And then the 21st century came and the access to information simply changed. It became really easy to get access to studies, medical information through medical websites, it then services through smartphone applications. Then now we know even more things, direct to consumer, genetic tests, uh, sensors, smartwatches, and fitness trackers we can use at home, a range of technologies that patients started getting access to. And this new kind of access led to a transition that we call digital health. So we, we published in many papers about this, that digital health is a cultural transformation. It's much more important how this hierarchical relationship between doctors and patients has been transforming into an equal level partnership, how the role of the passive patient has been transforming into a, a proactive, empowered patient role, and how the role of physicians of being the key holders to the ivory tower of medicine has been changing into being a guide for their patients in the jungle of information. Because of these reasons, this is a cultural transformation initiated but not driven by advanced technologies. 
So we can only create a healthcare system that is centered around the individual patient if we keep in mind the rules of digital health, that the goal of digital health is making patients the point of care. So in a few years, the normal should be that I get diagnosis, I, get, I can get treatments, even monitoring wherever I am, even if it's outside the hospital or at my home or on the way to somewhere, I have to become the point of care. We have to keep in mind that I need to have access to all my data, my medical records, the data I can obtain through the use of health sensors, variables that you talk so much about, smartphone apps, even through the use of services online, maybe artificial intelligence-based services or direct-to-consumer services, at-home lab tests and more. So based on this new kind of access to the data I already owned but couldn't see, there was no interface for that, healthcare has been gradually becoming more centered around the individual patient. But if you don't educate all stakeholders about that, if you don't help medical professionals prepare to work with such empowered patients, if you don't help patients manage their expectations about using such digital health technologies, if you don't educate policymakers about the need for using these technologies in a safe and efficient way, then I'm afraid we will keep on losing years. And just one more thing, what has changed because of COVID was that, you know, last March, 2020, spring 2020, in the span of weeks, millions worldwide started adopting the use of advanced technologies in healthcare. It was not a choice, but a must, but they had to start using telemedicine, uh, video consultation, at-home lab tests, health sensors, so many more things that you and I, you know, people like us had been preaching about for, for years before that, that the technological adoption just took place in weeks, but the cultural transformation just hasn't. But if you can put this cultural transformation, which is more about the mindset we in we people in healthcare have next to the technological adoption, then we might save a decade of progress in healthcare. That's I think that's the uh, the, the vision of digital health uh, holds for us. What a beautiful put uh, uh, answer there. I mean, it touched so many aspects, and this leads really well to the last question, which I will give you in a second. But I just want to reinforce: we talk a lot about patient centricity patient empowerment, patient engagement, and you really address all these items, of course, the emerging technologies, digital health, and even the pandemic. Beautiful answer. Really, really nice. Thank you so much. The last question that Do I... Do you mind if I keep on kicking this ball a bit further away? Well, go for, please. Patient centricity... Th thank you. That patient centricity might not even be enough anymore. I've been talking about patient design to many healthcare organizations and companies that, you know, being patient centric is so obvious. Of course, we are all working for patients to make their lives better. That's what healthcare is all about. But patient design means that we involve patients on the highest level of decision making of that organization, on the CEO level of the World Health Organization, of the Food and Drug Administration, of governments like Denmark and, uh, and the UK and Germany. They all have this approach that with patient design, by involving patients on the highest level of decision-making, we can really make sure that we come up with products, services, treatments, and so on, any process for patients that will meet their needs. I think only patient design can serve that role, not even patient centricity anymore. Thank you. That was, uh, yeah, yeah, that was really right. You mentioned Denmark. There are countries doing great work, such as Denmark, the Nordics, uh, the Netherlands are doing something in very innovative in terms of framework to exchange uh, patient data between organizations. So things are moving, but a fantastic answer. The last question that I have for you is, how do you envision healthcare in five or 10 years' time? What will look like? Yeah, uh, it's a, you know, the it's a... Timely question, even though I hate giving out predictions without context. But if you say three to five years, if you say healthcare in general, then let me be bold here and, and think about a vision that I would love to see in action in a few years' time. So in a few years' time, um, I only go to the point of care for procedures that require big radiology machines or surgical procedures, something that need a hospital building. Um, but otherwise, everything else in my disease and health management 
could be taken care of at the point of care, which should be me, wherever I am. I'm sure I will be using health sensors, um, fitness trackers, portable diagnostic devices, you know, ECG connected to a smartphone and stuff like that, based on which I can obtain data. I can obtain a lot of data about myself. I could get insights about my lifestyle, details about my health or disease management. But of course, even in five years, I won't have an AI to, to deal with that kind of data. I will be doomed with analyzing that huge amount of data. So I will have the data, I will have interfaces for accessing the data, but I will still need my medical professional to help me deal with it, get something meaningful out of that, that bunch of uh, you know, points and, and numbers. I have such a relationship with my primary care physician, by the way. Uh, we have an equal level partnership. She knows that I, I, I do measure things about myself. I do motivate myself for exercising every day through data. I wouldn't do it otherwise. Um, she knows that I've had many genetic tests, so uh, I know what kind of medications I would have a side effect for, or what kind of basic chronic conditions I might have a genetic risk for. I even had a microbiome test, so I know what kind of diet I should have based on the bacteria living in my digestive system. So we all know that, but so what? How shall I adjust my lifestyle to make sure I get the most out of it? So I think that in five years, everyone could have the same experience that I have been having. Many times I went to my primary care physician saying that, well, you know, I, I measured this or that. I have a question about that, even related to the technology that I was talking about. And many times she said, well, I don't know, but let's sit next to me and let's find out together. So if I can summarize this vision in one line, this is the line that a physician, a primary care physician maybe, should be able to say that I don't know, but let's find out together. Because there are so many things now that physicians simply cannot know. You can't go through 32, 33 million medical studies when there are that many out there. You can't go through all the evidence out there, all the textbooks. And you can't go through all the technologies that patients have been using. But you can have a, an open-minded approach saying that I have expertise in my medical specialty. That's why I've been uh, you know, learning and educating myself for so many years. You have an expertise about your own health and disease management. So let's find out together what's the best next decision for you. If I could summarize the future of healthcare in five years, that would be at the core of that vision. Working with a medical professional very closely, having a real life relationship based on trust while being surrounded by advanced, seamless, invisible technologies. Fantastic. What a way to finish. You remind me of the quantified self-movement, which started a long time ago, but actually not many people are doing it. But Bertland, what a way to finish. Fantastic. I want to thank you for your time and everything. But before, I always finish all my episodes with uh, a peculiar way, which is not really a question, is one minute of fame, which you can mean, you can mention anything, a professional achievement, a uh, personal achievement, a family member, a, a colleague, anything whatsoever, over to you to round up. One minute of fame. Anything, really anything. Any final thought or line, like an end message for people who, who watch the interview? Well, if I can ask anybody now to do something, that would be that please watch and read as much science fiction as you can. Um, nothing else prepares you better for what's coming next than reading and watching science fiction. I do that literally every single day. And I think by thinking about the what if question, what if this or that thing happens next? What if this technology becomes a nightmare privacy wise in healthcare or that technology can cure a disease for patients. But by playing with the what if question, we gradually prepare for the near future. Fantastic. Bertolan, thank you so much for your time. Nice to see you. I really appreciate your time, your expertise, your insights, and magnificent vision for healthcare. Um, so the pleasure was mine. Thank you so much, Joel, and so much. I wish you success with the with the show. Thank you again. And before I round up, I just would like to thank all our viewers. Make sure you subscribe and share the content with your communities in healthcare. And see you next time.